All right, so this morning, uh, what we want to do is pick up part two of our series, uh, two-week series, I, I said, where we're looking at the issues of homosexuality and gender issues, homosexuality and gender dysphoria. Uh, I broke it up in two parts, and as I mentioned a few, uh, as I mentioned last week, one of the things that uh, I wanted to do was walk through the scripture and, and simply make some statements. And some of those statements would be statements that reflect God's ideal, uh, some the nature of sin, and then some redemption. So last week, just by way of catching up last week, we noted that uh, God made humanity as male and female and pronounced it very good. So when God created man in his own image, he did not create simply one sex, one gender, but two males and females, their gender being tied to their biological sex. We also noted that God's um, design is that reproductive activity take place uh, through sexual intimacy between the man and the woman in marriage. Again, this is uh, God's design, his ideal, and uh, consequently then, a third point is that God's original design is for children to be raised by their father and mother. And that's simply the the basic uh, consequence of the idea that if a man and a woman alone through sexual intimacy can produce offspring, and they're only to do that within marriage, a relationship in which they are bound till death, then God's design clearly is for those offspring, those children, to be raised by uh, their biological father and mother in an ideal world. I noted, obviously, on this side of Genesis 3, biological fathers and mothers can die. Children may need to be separated for reasons because of the parent's sin, different, different things like this. But nonetheless, this is God's uh, ideal and design. We then noted that after Genesis 3, humanity is made up of people with sinful desires, and sinful desires by nature, because we all have fallen sinful natures, and so we desire things that are outside of God's ideal. So uh, a husband and wife may be married, father and mother have children, and yet, for example, that uh, husband slash father could have a desire for another woman. Well, that desire is outside of God's ideal, and that desire is a sinful desire. And those are the desires uh, that humanity has after Genesis 3 and that individuals battle with. Then my my next statement was, therefore, uh, our desires are not trustworthy guides for determining what is good and right for us. Now that, I think, is, again, should be obvious, but if our desires are sinful, if our desires are fallen, uh, corrupt, depraved, then we can't simply rely on our desires as if they are a guide for what we should do in life. Again, we know that because, um, you know, my youngest son, for example, would desire to eat sugar all day, every day. We, we know that his desire isn't right, but we also don't have to look at children. We know this in ourselves. We know it very well. And then uh, the last thing that I said then last week and elaborated on was the point that two of those sinful desires, among the many sinful desires we have, two of them we can identify is a desire to pursue homosexual activity and a desire to identify differently or pursue a different gender than God made you to be. Certainly, each of us as human beings doesn't have every sinful desire. Uh, Some of us have different sinful desires, but two of those sinful desires that some will find themselves having is that desire to pursue homosexual activity or to pursue a different gender. We labeled that uh, gender dysphoria. They will struggle and maybe want to be different than God has biologically made them to be. And so the last point I made then last week, and I didn't elaborate on and I'll dive into now, is that when gender dysphoria and homosexual desires are allowed to rule and are acted upon, an individual is sinning. This would be true generally of any sinful desire. When any sinful desire is acted upon, that individual is committing a sinful act. So it is also true when gender dysphoria and homosexual desires are acted upon, those are sinful acts. Um, Taking uh, gender dysphoria first among those. Our biological sex, our gender, our sex, what what God made us to be 
is, is not uh, in, in some ways arbitrary, but it's according, like I said, it's according to our, our who we are gender-wise, is, is identified by our biological makeup. And when God made men, he made men different than women. When he made women, he made women different than men. And that's why if you reflect two weeks ago when we said there's certain roles that God has for a man in the home and a man in the church and a different role for a woman in the home and a woman in the church, these things are not arbitrary. So it would not only then be a sinful act for a woman, for example, to refuse to walk in the role that God has for her as a woman in the home, it would also be a sinful act for that woman to decide, I want to attempt to be a man. That is not bowing the knee to God's design and who he has made her to be. Now, somebody might say, okay, you know, I do think that that's clear on that point, but is there any specific text that, that maybe explicitly addresses this. And I think there is one. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is writing to the Corinthians about uh, head coverings and issues, but it's really a, a man and woman issue because he's talking about their roles in the church. And he's saying that, that men have been designed a certain way, women have been designed a certain way. And so in order to reflect uh, the, their roles in the church, that when a man prays or prophesies, his head should be uncovered, and that a woman, when uh, she praise or prophesize should make, make her head uh, covered. And in the midst of it, he, he's doing a parallel with hair and, and the woman having long hair, and he says this, 1 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, is it, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. Now, our first reaction when we read a text like that might be, no, nature doesn't teach me that. I look at the trees out the window, and it doesn't necessarily communicate to me that if a man has long hair, that somehow that's wrong. That's a disgrace for him. But I don't think that's how Paul's using nature. I think what he's saying is uh, that, that, that by nature there, I think he's referring to the fact that in their culture, uh, Men with long hair would have been out of place. If you want to see my longer argument for that, you can, you can go to my sermon on 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16, and see this. But I think Paul's basic argument is this. In the Corinthian culture, for a man to have long hair would have made him look like a woman. It would have been an effeminate look. It would have been like me saying in our present context... Um, doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man wears a dress, that's a disgrace to him? Now, <clears throat> it, it's not as if, you know, the material of a dress or long, there's something in that that, that, that screams that's, that's never to be worn by man. It's, well, it, it, I'm picking up on our culture. In our cultural context, if a man wore a dress, that would, that would clearly communicate something to the broader culture that he's not walking in his role, it would be a disgrace to him. It would say he's attempting to appear to be a woman. That's what Paul was saying, I think, to the Corinthians about long hair in their context. But either way, the point's the same. What Paul is saying is, if it is a disgrace in the Corinthian context to wear long hair, i.e. to appear like a woman, then it is a disgrace in any context, regardless of, of what cultural, you know, acclamation or whatever that, that might take. In any context... It would be a disgrace for a man to present himself as if he were a woman because God has made him to be a man. And then we might say, you know, vice versa on that as well. So I do think that the Bible actually explicitly addresses this when Paul is telling the men and the women how to appear, how to adorn themselves, man with his head uncovered, woman with her head uncovered. And one of his reasons is because there's a clear delineation between men and women, and men should not appear to look like women and vice versa. So, so I think there are explicit texts. There's the broader um, recognition that God has simply made us male and female. We need to bow to that and recognize that a good, as a good thing. And the same is true in regards to homosexual practice. The Bible is just explicit about condemning homosexual activity again and again. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. 
Romans 1 speaks of homosexual activity as if it is living out the very judgment of God, committing shameless acts, Paul says. So, again, when we act on our sinful desires of gender dysphoria or homosexuality, we are committing sinful actions that the Bible condemns. Next point. Sin not only brings divine condemnation, but it never brings lasting satisfaction. Sin not only brings divine condemnation, but it never brings lasting satisfaction. In other words, it's not only that sin is condemned in the Bible, though that's sufficient for us to acknowledge and and, and to debate on it, but it's also true that sin, any sin, doesn't bring lasting satisfaction. This is why uh, the author of Hebrews can speak of Moses when he when he denied himself all the blessings of Egypt. The author of Hebrews categorized Moses as uh, turning away from the fleeting pleasures of sin. And that's how sin works. Sin provides us pleasures that are fleeting. And I think we know that. Sin doesn't give us lasting satisfactions. One of my One of my favorite images of this is uh, John Piper used an illustration one time where he said, sin is like picking up a chain that has a a huge diamond on it and seems so attractive, and then you hang it around your neck, and then you look down and that diamond has turned into a cockroach. I I think it's a beautiful image. I think that's exactly how sin works. It provides this immediate pleasure, but immediate pleasure that ultimately is fleeting. And this is how, this is how the Bible speaks of sin. Jeremiah 2, 13, the Lord uh, compares us pursuing sin to us turning away from the fountain of living waters and turning to a broken cistern that can't hold water, and any water in it is shallow. In other words, the Lord is saying you're, you're turning away from obedience to Him, something that actually will bring lasting satisfaction, and you're turning to something that is not satisfying. Water in the bottom of a broken cistern that obviously if any is there, it's little. It's not going to bring lasting satisfaction, and this is how sin works. I mentioned this at the very beginning of things when I introduced this topic last week, but those who pursue for example, gender dysphoria. They, they, they pursue uh, gender transitioning or a woman attempting to become a man, a man attempting to become a woman. The suicide rate among those who do these things is high. Uh, the, the, I, we, we, we take a poll as well if we want it. I know people would be honest, but we know it's true. Uh, those who are living in homosexual activities, uh, their satisfaction rate uh, for, for life is going to be low. We can say the same for anything. The man who finds himself perpetually committing adultery is not ultimately finding satisfaction. Um, and it's because that's simply how sin works. Um, so uh, then uh, not only then do I want to note that these sins bring divine condemnation, but they don't bring lasting satisfaction. Uh, next point. Individuals who are practicing homosexuality have attempted to be, or, or, and have attempted to become another gender can be redeemed through repentance and faith in the crucified and risen Lord. Individuals who have sinned and, and, and may have gone through a practice of continuously sinning, through homosexual activity, perhaps they've actually taken on a partner, you know, they've done whatever, or through uh, gender, pursuing a different gender, they, maybe they've actually even had surgery. These individuals can be redeemed through repentance and faith in the crucified and risen Lord like anybody else. One of the gl- most glorious texts when you think about the sin of homosexuality is what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's how he continues, and this is what's so glorious about it. The next phrase he says is, and such were some of you. But you were washed You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. One of the things that we need to make sure as a church 
that we shout as loudly as homosexuality is sin, uh, attempting to become a, gender, a different gender than yourself is sin. Those things are true, and we need to state them, state them very clearly, and, and, and we can shout them loudly. We must also make sure that we are stating clearly and shouting loudly, and you who are practicing homosexuality can be redeemed. And you who have even attempted to transition to another gender, you can be redeemed. And such were some of you. In other words, in the, in the Corinthian church, Paul was dealing with believers who had been practicing homosexuality. And he had called them to repentance and faith in the gospel. And they had been redeemed out of that situation. We're now walking in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. The same is true uh, for those who have um, given in to gender dysphoria, who have, who have practiced uh, an attempt to become a different gender. They can be redeemed as two. two. And, and I think sometimes if, if we were to say, man, you know, what in the world would, would, would happen if, say, say you had a neighbor and, you know, you meet this, this individual and he in, introduces himself as Stephen to you and, and all of a sudden you're, you know, kind of interacting with him periodically. You're out in the yard, you're doing stuff, you wave, right? Help, help him fix his lawnmower, whatever. You're going along, fine. You got this neighbor, Stephen, everything seems normal. And then one night, let's say uh, you've been sharing the gospel with this individual because you know he's an unbeliever. And let's say one night, Stephen shows up at your door uh, with tears streaming down his face. And he says to you, hey, I'm not a he at all. I'm not Stephen. I was born Stephanie. And I am uh, now, in light of what you've shared with me in the gospel, I am, I am ready to repent and believe and, and, and to walk away from my sin. Now, <clears throat> what do you do? What, what, what is your reaction if Stephen, through tears, or Stephanie in this case, through tears, is, is sharing with you that she had gone all the way to having, you know, hormone therapy and... Uh, surgery and, and, and these things to make herself appear as a man. Here's what you do. You rejoice and you thank God that another individual who has been pursuing and walking in sin is finding grace through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that it is an easy path now for Stephanie to uh, simply begin changing her life. There's going to be a, a whole need of transformation, of, of having conversations with individuals, all of that. But there is nothing, there is nothing that keeps anyone who has pursued homosexuality to the farthest extent or, or, or gender you know, transformation, however they want to define it, to the farthest extent. There's nothing that keeps them from being redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. Which leads to my next point. No one who repents and believes is a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. No one who repents and believes is a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. There are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. We do not say to any individual, this is great that you've come to repentance and faith, but because you have sinned in these ways prior to coming to repentance and faith, you're kind of always going to be second tier. You're always going to be a second class citizen. You're always going to have to wear the, the scarlet letter. No. What we say to the individuals, like Paul said to the Corinthians, and such were some of you, we thank God that you've walked out of homosexuality. Now live a godly life, and you are the same as any of us in the sense that we are all sinners. And, and, and our sins may have been different from homosexuality. Our sins may have been different than pursuing a different gender. But our sins as a group who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ have been forgiven, and we have been cleansed. Again, just think Rahab. This prostitute whom the Lord redeems and she comes into the people of God and then she marries uh, Salmon and they have Boaz and they have uh, Boaz has Obed who has Jesse who has David who ultimately from his line comes Christ himself. Uh, Rahab though a prostitute and the scripture continually refers to Rahab even the New Testament. Rahab the prostitute. Why? I think it's because Scripture's constantly sending the message. Look how Rahab the 
prostitute is used of the Lord. Look how Rahab the prostitute is in the line of Christ because it's sending the message, not even a prostitute, if she, has rede- if she has redeemed, remains somehow some kind of outside the people of God or, or somehow she has to be a second-class citizen. I think it's a continual reminder there's nothing that is beyond the saving, redeeming hand of God. And when we are saved, when we are redeemed through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we are not second-class citizens And that counts for not only those who have walked in homosexuality and those who have walked in uh, gender transitioning, but anything else as well. Again, um, does it mean there aren't going to need to be huge steps taken in our lives? Of course, there there are in in so many of our cases. Um, But there are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Um, Next. The second we're justified by God... All of our sinful desires do not go away, and we will not be free from all of them until the resurrection. The second we're justified by God, all of our sinful desires do not go away, and we will not be free from all of them until the resurrection. In other words, one of the things that I would love to be able to say to an individual who's, who's walking in sin and I'm evangelizing them, I'd love to be able to say, listen, if you repent and believe, uh, all your sinful desires will just flee right away from you. The reality is there are some miraculous occasions. I had a friend, for example, who was, who was uh, into drugs so heavily that he overdosed two different weekends, just back-to-back weekends, both occasions. It looked like he was going to die. He lived through it. And when he came to faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ just a few weeks after that, He said immediately any desire for drugs just left him. He just immediately, no desires at all for them. Um, I don't think that's the rule. I think that's an exception. Um, Even um, Nathan Young will share, when he became a believer, he was also doing drugs. And he says the desires were were intense. He had to keep battling with it for weeks. And the Lord finally brought him out of uh, some of those uh, things. And um, I think that's just par for the course. You know, if you're a believer, that you had sinful desires before you came to faith, and many of those sinful desires still linger. It may be over time, some desires can weaken. Uh, there, there may be certain steps we take uh, to deny ourselves things. So, so um, you know, it may be that uh, you have simply uh, said, I've, I've, I've taken steps to uh, every time, You know, there would be a lustful situation. I I turn my eyes away. I don't expose myself to these things. And so you may say, uh, my desire, for example, uh, you may say, before I was a believer, I was I was looking at pornography like crazy, and and but I've taken these steps. My desire to do so has lessened. Um, But but it's also the case that a number of us can testify. Some of our sinful desires just seem to be always there, and that the, they are always strong, and we're always doing war. And this is a Christian idea. Paul says in Galatians five sixteen to seventeen. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. In other words. Paul, talking to believers, says it's as if this war is going on and the desires of the Spirit are at war with the desires of the flesh and they're doing battle. But the the mere fact that he can mention to believers that our flesh has desires, that he can mention to believers that it will be as if there is a war going on within us at times, is a reminder to us that just because we've repented and believed and just because we've been baptized, or we've come to faith, we've professed faith in baptism, it doesn't mean at that moment that we're justified that somehow all our desires go away and our sinful desires go away. And those sinful desires will linger, some of them will linger until the resurrection. Even Paul can say in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I discipline my body to keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Why would Paul need to discipline himself? Because Paul is addressing his fleshly desires. And, and again, you and I know this reality. So many of us would say, man, if I could snap my fingers and make the desire for others to exalt me go away, I would do it. But maybe you would say, this is something I battle with all the time. If I could, if I could snap my fingers and, and, and just lose the fleshly desire to want to be in control of all things so that I, I, um, 
you know, can, I don't know, maybe help my anxiety or, or whatever, right? If I could lose that sinful desire to be in control, but instead just always trust that God's in control, I would do it. But, but this is a battle that I have to, you know, fight again and again and again. Um, again, we know this to be true. Now, now, obviously, you're no doubt already thinking this, but I'll go ahead and make this next point then explicit. This also means then that same-sex attraction and desires and gender dysphoria may not go away when one is saved, and they may linger until the resurrection. In other words, I don't want you to be deceived. If, 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 if you're an unbeliever walking in homosexuality and you come to faith in Christ, it may not be that in a, man, just the snap of the fingers in an instant, all of a sudden your desire your attraction for the same sex immediately goes away, and all of a sudden you develop this healthy attraction for the opposite sex in an instant as well. That may happen. No doubt individuals have shared that, um, but, but I think that's probably not common. I think probably these desires, these sinful desires, are the same as all other sinful desires in that typically what happens is we come to faith in Christ, and then we begin to make war against our fleshly desires, but our fleshly desires linger. And, and, and no doubt, many of us, regardless of what our sinful desires are, have probably been before the Lord in prayer, maybe with tears streaming down our face, saying, Lord, if you will take away this sinful desire, it seems that it would be good for both of us. Right? It would honor you, it would be good for me, and, and yet it's required that we fight and discipline our bodies, even as Paul says. However, I also want to make this next point. No matter how strong our sinful desires, the demand for all Christians is that we die to ourselves and obey Christ without exception. No matter how strong our sinful desires, the demand for all Christians is that we die to ourselves and obey Christ without exception. Jesus Christ demands obedience. Here's what he calls us to, Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. In other words, the call to every single believer is, it doesn't matter what your sinful desires are, you have to put them to death and walk in obedience. Therefore, when we say to the individual, the, the professing believer who feels homosexual desires, hey, brother or sister, you've got to put that sinful desire to death, and you've got to walk in obedience. Somebody might say, man, that is a really hard task that you are calling your brother or sister in Christ to. And my answer is, it's the exact same task that we call every other believer to. There have been brothers and sisters we know who maybe struggle with such desires of covetousness that it controls their lives. They are just full of envy and, and desire to have what others have. And what we say to them is not, man, I, that desire seems so strong, that must be so hindering, you know, that, that, that I feel like every once in a while you need to give yourself an out and really give in to that covetousness. Every once in a while give yourself an out and, and just really lavish um, you know, yourself in terms of uh, trying to get what others have and just, just kind of rest in the envy that you feel and let it overcome you? Of course not. We say to that individual, you've got to put that sinful desire of covetousness to death and you've got to put that sinful desire of envy to death and you have got to walk in obedience. And if somebody says, but that is hard, you say, yes, this is why Jesus Christ calls us to take up our cross and to die daily to our sins and walk in obedience to Him. Yes, it's hard. And listen, for the individual whom we have called to walk out of uh, gender confusion, the individual whom we've called to walk out of homosexual practice, it will be difficult, but the Lord is with you. And one day, one of my favorite lines in, in Andrew Walker's book I mentioned about God and the transgender debate is Andrew Walker talks about imagining an individual who, is, who has walked in, you know, gender dysphoria. 
and uh, maybe at one point in their lives, you know, they, they've even given in to it, and now they've walked out of it, or maybe this is just always the struggle, and day after day after day, that confusion is there. Day after day after day, those sinful desires are there, but they keep holding on. They keep walking in obedience. They, they, they keep honoring the Lord Jesus Christ, or the individual who, well, I'll, I'll, first, I'll, I'll stay there, because that, that's what Andrew Walker talks about, and here's what he writes. How brilliant it is to think of God one day saying to the person with gender dysphoria who waited faithfully, well done. I know it's been hard. It's over now. I love you so much that I have brought you to a place where you feel now who you are. And who you truly are is completely enmeshed with your desires. There will be no more pain, no more crying for you anymore. What you long for to feel like and look like and be the same person is a reality. I know it's been painful. It won't be now. Well done, faithful follower. And you can take that glorious monologue there that, that Andrew uh, Walker just, just, just noted about what the Lord could say to that individual, and you could say it to anybody. To the individual who feels same-sex attraction and is battling and and, and every day is saying, Lord, obedience to you means a certain lack of companionship that that others are finding through marriage. Uh, Being obedient to you means saying no to some desires that I feel very deeply. Lord, being obedient to you means that I'm going to live in a culture in which seemingly everybody around me is telling me do X or do Y, and I'm saying no because the Lord Jesus Christ demands otherwise, but it is hard. Well, one day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to say to that brother or that sister, well done. I know it's hard. I know you had to live your life battling these desires that seem so strong, but well done, and now your desires... And what you are to be and do are matched up perfectly. And you get to live your whole life finally stopping finding. But, 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 but I hope we all know and I hope we all acknowledge that reality isn't somehow unique to the struggle with gender dysphoria or homosexual react, uh, attraction. Uh, I, I remember in, in my own life, uh, in, in my high school days, I I moved to, we, we used to live in the eastern part of the state of Kentucky, and I had some godly friends. And then when I was uh, going into eighth grade, so 12 to 13, that, that age range, I remember we, we moved to the western part of the state. And I went to a school where I didn't have believing friends in my class until uh, my senior year. One of my friends uh, became a believer. And uh, so for five years, basically, I was just living my life uh, every day in a public school system uh, with friends around me who were unbelievers. And all they were doing was just constantly, over those five years, talking constantly about their sinful exploits. uh, My my, my male friends were, were, you know, wanting all of us to know uh, what they were doing in terms of sexual morality. Even female friends were wanting to share the same thing. And it was a difficult reality. It was a time in my life when, uh, honestly, I, I really battled with uh, being depressed because I was constantly, it's not as if I didn't sinfully desire to do all the things they were bragging about. Of course, I had those desires, but I knew the Lord demanded otherwise, so I was putting those desires at bay, attempting not to walk in sexual morality, while at the same time, hearing what they were saying and, and at times and in weak moments envying them and and it was a fight a fight in which I felt alone a fight in which I felt depressed and one of the great things that I think I can say is not only waiting until the judgment but even in that moment I feel that my father was saying to me well done I know it's hard uh, I know you feel alone but you're not alone and uh, well, really, that, that then leads to the, the next point I want to make. The Spirit will empower you to walk in obedience. The Spirit will empower you to walk in obedience. One of the great things that, that Paul does in the book of Romans is by the time you get to chapter 6, Paul makes clear, look, you're, you, if you're a believer, you are not bound in sin anymore. If you're a believer, you're not simply bound to your flesh anymore. 
uh, these things do not have ultimate control over you. Yes, it would have been true. As a believer, you were bound in sin. As a believer, you were unable to please God. As a believer now, though, you've been freed from the dominion of sin. You've been given the Spirit so that you can walk in obedience. And so when an individual says, for example, if I'm counseling a, uh, you know, a, a young man who is a believer, and he says, uh, I, I've, I've looked at pornography for all these years, and I'm, I'm, I'm attempting to walk out of it. I don't think I can. My answer is, yes, you can. Yes, you can. I know you can. You don't have to bow down to it, because sin no longer has dominion over you. That's what Romans 6 says. Because you have the Spirit of God, you can walk in obedience. So no matter what the sin is, and, and looking at these issues specifically, gender dysphoria and homosexuality, as deep as the sinful desires are, if you're a believer, you have the Spirit of God, sin no longer has dominion over you, you have died to sin, and you are now living through the Spirit unto Christ, and you can walk in obedience because God has given your, you His Spirit to empower you. This was one of the promises about the new covenant. In the old covenant, you saw Israel just constantly walking in disobedience. And one thing God said was, I'm going to make a covenant with you, and I'm going to put a new heart in you, and I'm going to put my Spirit in you, and I'm going to cause you to walk in my ways. How is God causing us to walk in His ways? By giving us His Spirit freeing us from the dominion of sin so that, yes, we have sinful desires, but the Spirit Himself within us is desiring obedience and giving us the ability to do that. And that then brings us to uh, the final point I want to make. Christ has given us one another, that is the church, to aid us as we follow Christ. Christ has also given us one another, that is the church, to aid us as we follow Christ. One of the great things is it might be enough for us to say, well, not only has the Lord freed us from the dominion of sin when we've come to faith in Christ, but He also gives us His Spirit so that we are empowered to walk in obedience. That is a glorious reality, and that might be sufficient alone. But that's not the only thing He's done. He's also given us one another. He's given us the church. And so, yes... There are moments that we feel quite weak. It seems as if our sinful desires are going to win the day. But in those moments, one of the great things is that if we walk with other brothers and sisters in Christ, in our weakness, another brother or sister of Christ might find strength. Uh, when they feel weak, we might be strong. And so one of the glorious things that we have in the church is the ability to walk with others and say, pray for me, help me, aid me, encourage me. Um, one of the things that we're told to do in Hebrews chapter 3 is we exhort one another every day so that you are not hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, the author of Hebrews says. In other words, sin can harden my heart. It can deceive me. It can make it look like sin is a good way to go. But the Lord has given me brothers and sisters in Christ to exhort me every day. And this has happened, no doubt we can all testify to this, moments in my life where maybe my thinking gets a bit clouded, my, my heart gets a bit hard, my mind and heart get a bit deceived in sin, and a brother or sister of Christ comes along and says something, or I hear a brother in Christ preach God's Word or teach God's Word, and all of a sudden it just removes the darkness, and all of a sudden my mind begins to be uh, thinking a bit more clearly, and, 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 and the Lord is using His church in those moments to graciously preserve and help. And so in this situation, I want you to know, especially if you are a professing believer, if you're a member of Cornerstone Community Church, and you've listened to this, and you say, Lee, these issues, maybe one of these issues, maybe both of these issues, this is what I have been walking in. I feel gender dysphoria like crazy, and I've been, been wanting to go the route the culture is telling me, or I have uh, battled uh, these homosexual desires. I feel such attraction to the same sex, and, and then not a healthy attraction to the opposite sex. And so, um, I, I, I just, I need help with this. What I'm saying to you as one of your pastors is come to us. It doesn't have to be that you have to be afraid or, or that you have to think, but what if they don't understand? You know what? Very seldom 
do any of us completely understand the sinful struggles of another individual. But the Lord has called us to walk together. You may not understand some of my sinful desires, but I'm still going to ask you to pray for me. I'm still going to ask you to walk with me. And so it is true with you. We will walk with you. We will help you. We believe the Lord's design is not only to call you obedience, but to call you to obedience within a group of people who love you and who will oversee you and who will care for you and who will pray for you and who will exhort you and walk alongside of you. And it's actually the church as a family where we find enormous strength. Ed Shaw, I I mentioned the book, uh, Same-Sex Attraction in the Church, and his uh, subtitle, The Surprising Plausibility of Living the Christian Life, is Ed Shaw says he became a believer, same-sex desires didn't go away, healthy opposite-sex desires didn't all of a sudden appear, and all of a sudden, so he goes, okay, so if I'm going to walk in obedience to Christ, I'm going to put to death my sinful desires uh, to pursue somebody of the same sex. So I'm not doing that. But he said what it means then is that I'm just going to live the celibate life. I'm just going to live as a single person. And uh, again, the subtitle, the surprising plausibility of it. His answer is if you say, man, but that is really hard all of a sudden for a guy like Ed Shaw to say, well, I guess I'm just going to be single my whole life. How is he going to uh, feel part of a family like, like somebody like me gets to experience? I married Lily and I have these children and, and, and that's a reality that Ed Shaw, unless the Lord doesn't get a miraculous work in his heart and gives him a healthy uh, sexual attraction to the opposite sex, he, he, he's never going to experience that. Is he robbed? Is he, how, how is he going to, you know, experience these realities? And here's what he writes. It can be incredibly lonely. Unless, that is, we take Jesus' definition of family and really live it. Now, now what, what's he mean? Jesus' definition of family. Do you remember the moment where individuals come and they say, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus' response is, my mother, my brothers, my sisters are those who do the will of the Father. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, we have families, but there is a family that is much larger than your your biological uh, immediate family you know. If you are a believer, you have hundredfold fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and children. We have this relationship with one another in the church where when you become a believer, all of a sudden, instantly, you're brought into a family that is huge and a family, interestingly, that will last forever. My children make, you know, Lord willing, they'll grow up and and leave my home one day Uh, Lily and I may be dead and my children might not have parents, but this is one of the reasons why we push them to the local church and say there is a forever family that you will have in a local church. Your father and mother, your earthly father and mother may not be around in your whole life, but God has given you a hundredfold, fathers and mothers. Your brothers and sisters may not be around your whole life, but God has given you a hundredfold brothers and sisters. This is Jesus' idea to understand the church as a family. And so this is why Ed says, yes, it can be incredibly lonely unless we take Jesus' definition of family and really live it. Unless we notice Paul's experience of family, Paul again, one who was never married, unless we experience Paul, unless we notice Paul's experience of family and work together to copy it. Unless we wake up to the radical New Testament idea that the church really is family. God has very kindly put me, he says, in a family of people of all ages, backgrounds, and circumstances. And we're slowly learning to be family to one another, just as Jesus says we should be. And Jesus has made us to be. He was, as ever, telling us the truth when he said... Truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. And crucially, 
this new family benefits us all. There is give and take from all of us all of the time. It strengthens single people, but it also strengthens marriages. It's not perfect. There are constant ups and downs. All human relationships get messy at times, but they are a mess worth making. Because when it works, it's the most wonderful of experiences for all of us. And the plausibility of the life that I have chosen is closely tied to this experience. This is something I think I've known walking with Cornerstone Community Church. The Lord was very gracious to give me an uh, earthly father and mother who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who have been amazing parents. But I will say over the last 21 years that I've pastored Cornerstone, I thank the Lord and have walked with fathers and mothers who have poured into my life, perhaps even as much as my biological father and mother, who have uh, blessed me. I've walked with brothers and sisters with whom I've even walked more closely than I have my biological uh, sisters. And so there is a rich blessing found in the family of God. And so this is why living holy lives is possible. God's given us a spirit, and he's given us one another to the church. And so in this day, when the culture is saying, the only answer is to give into your sinful desires, and then you'll find peace, but there's no peace, there's no satisfaction, there's no lasting uh, you know, glory in that. What I want us to do is call all of us back to obedience in Christ and call us to walk together in obedience in Christ as a family to be a countercultural example to the world at large. Let them see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven, even longing to walk with us, to have what we have that ultimately is much more satisfying than the fleeting pleasures of sin. And so let me pray for us this morning and then we'll end our time. Father, if anyone does have these struggles, I pray this morning that you would bring them, if, if they've been walking in disobedience, bring them to repentance. If they have these struggles and they've been afraid or fearful to admit it or share it, I pray that you would encourage them to do so. And I pray for us that we might walk as the family of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as he pictures. And we pray this for our good and for the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.